be seated. Our lecturer for this morning is Karen Collins.
for us. Center your lives on this very love. See it in your coming and in your going. See it in your work and in your rest. See it in your relationships and in your home. Bind it as a tradition in everything that you do. This love of God. And this passage in Deuteronomy was such a central component of life for the Hebrews that they maintained the tradition of saying it regularly in their homes. And it's called the Shema. The Shema. The Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the Hebrews uh, maintained the tradition of saying it. And we know that by the 2nd century B.C. it was repeated twice a day in every devout home, morning and night. The families would gather and they would repeat the same words over and over again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then you can just imagine the kids, the Jewish kids, uh, you know, they're rolling their eyes at this and they're telling their parents, well, we just, we just said this this morning. Why do we have to say it again tonight? The Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Whatever. This is so boring. Why do we have to do it again? We just did this. Do we have to do it again? You're making us do it again? I mean, Come on, why do we have to keep saying this over and over again? It's like the protest that my parents heard from the back seat as they hauled me to church, or they hauled me to Sunday school, or youth group, or vacation Bible school, and, and all those events that my parents took me and my brothers and sisters where I just kept hearing about and experiencing the love of God at church. Why do we have to do this? This is so boring. It's so boring. Why do we have to repeat these words over and over again? It's kind of dumb. We just did this. We just did this this morning. We just did it yesterday. Can't take it any longer. So it's important for us, I think, to remember these words of Moses, but why is it important? Why was it and why is it so important to remember that the Lord your God is one and that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? Why? Why? Well, Mary is driving home from work after a long day. And she looks over at the briefcase that contains a considerable amount of work that she has to complete now that evening. And she despairs at how much time her work is taking from her. And she braces herself for the complaints from her husband and her children who want more quality time with their mother. And quality time, she thinks. What in the world is that? What is quality time? And how do you find quality time, she wonders. And she chastises herself for falling so far behind in her work. She chastises herself for falling so far behind in her exercise program. I mean, she's wanted to stay healthy. So that reminds her that her clothes no longer fit, and she needs, she needs to buy new clothes or, or lose weight. And, and of course, that's a horrible choice to have to choose between those two things. And then thinking about her weight reminds her of her nagging mother, and she remembers that she needs to call her parents because they're not well. And then that reminds her of that odd spot on her neck that she found the other day that she really needs to go in and get it checked, but there's no time to go and sit forever in a doctor's office. And she has no idea what she's going to do about dinner tonight or how she'll begin to approach the mountains of laundry that are waiting for her in her home. Everyone is talking about the movie, The Grand Budapest Hotel, because it just 
nominated for an Oscar, and they're talking about it at work, and she needs to be left out of the conversation, but she still she hasn't had time in her schedule to go see it. Her church is encouraging her to join a book study about the soul this Lent, and, and uh, she had good intentions of picking up the book, but she uh, had to get to the grocery store instead. But on the way to the grocery store, she received a phone call from her impatient son who was panicking because he needed to be picked up at school for a ride home because he had a ton of homework that night to get done, and he was all in a panic, and he was waiting a whole minute, but it seemed like an eternity for him. So he had called her about five or six times to get a ride home. So the mom dropped the son off at home, and as they pulled into the driveway, she was greeted by the dog, and that reminded her that she really needs to get the dog to the groomer and to the vet. The daughter came out of the house and reminded her of the parent-teacher conferences that were scheduled for tonight. And then she received a phone call that the plumber can't come to fix the stuffed up sink unless someone is home during the day. And she remembers the little tiff last night she had with her husband over who would take off from work to actually be at home to wait for the plumber. She has more unanswered emails at home than, than she can count. And her friends are upset with the poor communication skills. And worse than that, some are thinking, some of her friends are thinking that she doesn't really care for them anymore. So she picks up the cell phone and she returns a call from an old college friend just to cross something off her list. And the friend is delighted to hear from her and asks her how she's doing. And Mary, Mary launches into this litany of all the pressures on her life and the well-being. Francis, oh, sweet, wouldn't you? You just need to be yourself. And Mary's thinking, who is that? I don't even know who I am. I mean, Mary's life has become an arena of competing expectations for her. I don't know if that sounds familiar to any of you. I think all of the things that Mary is involved in are important things. They are all valued things. All of them are freely chosen. Yet all of them struggle, you see, with each other to be the center of her life. And the competition of all of those things is tearing apart her soul. You see, each of our commitments try to define us by their own agenda. In trying to satisfy the demands of work and home and health and all of the relationships turns life into a relentless pinball game. And no demand is satisfied for long. Eventually, I think like Mary, we have no idea who we are anymore. And without integrating our lives without an integrating center. Our days are reduced to a series just of anxious reactions to all the things that are going on in life. So this is why, this is precisely why we are launching this series of caring for our souls this month. It is because of this tiny, fragile, vulnerable, precious thing about you that is called your soul. You are not just a self, but you are a soul. And why should we spend a whole series, why should we spend six weeks just talking about the soul? Well, I want to tell you why. Because your soul is the deepest thing about you. Your soul is the deepest thing about you. And if you don't recognize it, if you don't acknowledge it, if you don't care for it, life will constantly be a struggle and a battle for you. And life will be joyless for you. Without an 
integrated center. The things in your life, if not integrated, will be the opposite of integrated. And of course, that is disintegrated. That's what your life will become without a focus on your soul. So we all need to focus on the soul and care for our soul. We need to care for our own. But guess what? When you live in a community, and when you live in a family, you not only, when you live in a church, you not only are called to care for your own soul, but you're called to care for the souls of others as well. Our job, ultimately, is to watch each other's souls as well. At the heart of love is to care for the soul of another person, not to care for their success, not just to care for their physical needs or their bodily needs, but to care for their soul. That's what the Bible teaches. So we're going to do this series because the Bible says it's our job to do this. It's our job to care for our soul, and it's our job to care for others' souls. So the soul is your life center. The soul is your life center as a human being, and your life is under the direction. The whole of your life is under the direction of your soul. The soul is that aspect of your whole being that correlates and that integrates and that enlivens everything. And I mean everything. And so this is why Moses said from the earliest days, and this is why churches and houses of religion have been offering this tradition of centering life on loving God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And as Jesus translates this tradition of the church, loving your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself. So there it is. That is what is behind our focus on the soul for these 40 days. Of course, you know and I know that we don't just focus on our souls for 40 days, but that's a lifetime of focusing, isn't it? It's a lifetime. So yes, yes, in the midst of your busy schedule, the church is asking you to do one more thing. And that's to care for your soul. That's hopefully today to pick up a book and read a book, join a Bible study, and to focus on caring for your soul and caring for the souls of those who are around you. Your calling today is to function with all the demands of life as a person centered on the love of God. Our calling is to love God and love the neighbor in all of these demands. And it's not an easy call. It's far from easy. It is a difficult and challenging call. So that's why we're focusing on the soul. To make it all worthwhile. Um, let's stand and confess our faith.